Hello and welcome to the official podcast of Palate Exposure, featuring Alona Thompson, a podcast for those seeking the ultimate in wine, food, and travel. Each week, she interviews winemakers, chefs, celebrities, and a variety of guests that shape the way we enjoy life. Ilona Thompson, Palette Exposure. I'm here with Tim McDonald, who actually has probably forgotten more than most of us will ever know. Three decades in the industry, um, he founded a company, a marketing and communication company that's called Wine Spoken Here, that's been in existence for 12 years. And we're going to get to know him personally and professionally. Very excited about that. So, Tim, let's just get some basic details like where were you born? How did you come to be? Um, Thanks, Ilona. Uh, I grew up in Las Vegas, Nevada, and uh, my dad was a stagehand, and that's where we ended up because there was theater work there for people running spotlights, etc., mm-hmm. uh, building sets. And um, I grew up uh, wanting to figure out this eating and mo- mostly about eating and drinking. Uh, so my first job was at the Stardust Hotel. Hmm. I, I worked uh, as a as a waiter uh, in the Palm Room, uh, which was their coffee shop, a three meal a day place that uh, was a lot of fun and kind of cut your teeth on it. Um, we got lucky and got promoted to the steakhouse there. At, uh, I had a pal of mine, Gilbert Martin, who was also um, very interested in wine and uh, food, and so my pal uh, and I would um, uh, work same shifts, same places, and then we got promoted to where the Lido de Paris was, and the dinner shows, and there was a time that uh, you went to a dinner show, and then there was the midnight show where there were only cocktails, and so we very much uh, uh, enjoyed the uh, experience of working, waiting on uh, tables. And uh, sometimes people even say, so, well, that must have been really interesting, uh, made a lot of money. I said, we did it, we made pretty good money, but, you know, Visa and MasterCard hadn't been invented yet. So we wow. were very fortunate that the cash was king. Uh, and then um, uh, I went to UNLV, uh, although I changed my major to hotel. Uh, mm. I started uh, in communications. And just enjoyed uh, hotel management and restaurant management and being around uh, the three restaurants that I'd uh, worked there. And in about 1976 or so, I got to uh, work with another friend that I'd met at the Tillerman restaurant. We invented uh, uh, our version of surf and turf with the salad bar brought to the table. Uh, and eventually, I got back into the hotel space and worked at the Flamingo Hilton for a bit and Mm -hmm. uh, at some point I was just wanting to uh, move to where there was water. Ah. Like like the ocean for for example. Uh, You grow up in the desert uh, so I left before the big boom that you see today. Okay. And uh, got a job over in Honolulu as a uh, uh, assistant room service manager at the Hilton Hawaiian Village and then um, had a couple of restaurant jobs, managed a couple of restaurants, Mm -hmm. opened the Blue Water Cafe uh, on Cujillo, which was the first country and western uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner place in in Waikiki. Uh, And then during a short period of, um, oh, I uh, helped open the Honolulu Club too, which is over by Blaisdell. Um, So I enjoyed uh, both the customer side of it, but I also liked the, the managing side of it. And at one point, the economy really went south in uh, in Honolulu um, because of tourism, and I ended up unemployed and got a job with McKesson Wine and Spirits as a salesman, uh, working the Waikiki and eventually the military market there in Oahu. Hmm. And that was a blast because suddenly I wasn't working at night, I wasn't um, waiting uh, on clients, whether it was cocktail, cl- you know, serving food, I had to get up in the morning and call on accounts. Hmm. And uh, 
We used to run our territories. The cutoff time was around noon. Um, uh, no, no one had any form of communications. You carry change in your pockets to make some phone calls and call in your orders for delivery. And uh, and then when you were done at cutoff time, which was generally around noon, uh, then you could go uh, hit up and, and, and go call in restaurants uh, for not for Tuesday delivery, but for Wednesday. So uh, uh, I had the ABC chain, which was fun. It's a, a collection of convenience stores, of which there are dozens of them in Waikiki. Uh, and had to keep the shelves stocked, and then I spent the afternoons and evenings uh, looking after my restaurant clients. One day Seagram hired me, and I got to move to San Francisco, 1983. 1983. I was the first chain store manager in Northern California for Seagram Distillers, and the most popular whiskey in, uh, uh, around at that time was Seagram 7. So uh, we, we, we uh, were fortunate to call on chains and uh, ultimately got promoted to run the state of Nevada, mm -hmm. as well as uh, included in that, oddly enough, was Alaska, <laughs> and uh, because it was separated by control states. So I did that for a year and then got to move uh, and get promoted one, one more time, one final time with Seagram, where I was in national accounts calling on headquarters of uh, restaurant chains and hotel groups like Hyatt Hotels, Radisson Hotels, etc., cetera, Stouffer, and, uh, and a few restaurant chains uh, that were popular back then. Uh, that was a big job. Yeah, it really was. It was my first corporate um, position where, um, you know, you, you really had to uh, sell an entire portfolio. And Seagram used to have, uh, well, they certainly were, were a large wine uh, outfit back then. Seagram is thought of as being mostly spirits, but in fact, uh, they owned Palmasan. Hmm. They had uh, Champagne Mum. They had bi they built Mum Champagne here in Napa, mm -hmm. um, and they had a lot of uh, agency brands that they looked after for other people, uh, as well as they were an importer of uh, uh, Barton and Guestier, mm -hmm. uh, plus th uh, they're most known in wine circles for Chateau and Estates, where they had plenty of Bordeaux, uh, some Spanish producers, uh, very much a European portfolio. Uh, I think at one point I wanted to get back to California, so uh, or the West Coast, shall we say. Mm -hmm. And uh, after five years, I came back here, um, got, got a temporary job with Jalco, which was a distributor, again, calling on chains. Um, and my mentor and, and boss at the time was David Gainza, who's still with Southern Glaciers uh, here in Northern California. Uh, although I think they call the department American Wine. And um, Hubeline hired me, and again, I'm calling on national account chains here in the West Coast, a little bit different, but a lot of fun. And uh, there's nothing like calling on a, a Weston Hotel headquarter or an El Torito headquarter or a Stuart Anderson's, because when you got the order, uh, it was generally for a long time, and it was consistent and uh, reliable. So if you called on big chains, uh, you could be a hero. Uh, at a interesting juncture with Hubeline, which is uh, basically Diageo, Seagram, same thing, basically Diageo, although with the mergers and acquisitions the last several years, um, Hubeline was also a very big wine um, player with uh, Beaulieu uh, Vineyard. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they, at some point there, had Christian Brothers Wine and Inglenook and represented other uh, wine labels in the import side. Uh, including Lungarote, uh, Mastro Berardino, Ciretto, um, uh, La Doucette, uh, just a pretty pretty nice uh, portfolio of both wines and spirits. Known in their spirits for Smirnoff and Cuervo and a few things like mm. that. Um, and that was a very uh, uh, pleasant mm, to move when I was about 40 into uh, the PR role because they had purchased Glenn Ellen from the Benzinger family. Mm -hmm. I ended up uh, uh, doing uh, my best to learn and practice how to be a good communicator within the uh, wine space. Uh, the internet hadn't been birthed yet and we had newspaper journalists and we had magazines and we had um, 
uh, uh, the role of pitching uh, uh, brands for fits for mm -hmm. them to fit and food and wine magazine was just getting started and you know the internet didn't exist yet so uh, all of our influencers were basically an, uh, uh, out of a newspaper column whether it would be in San Francisco LA Seattle Portland etc uh, and there was at that time probably a couple of hundred wine writers that um, were either doing weekly um, um, uh, contributions uh -huh. and then some of them did feature stories because uh, that's what they did they might have been in a magazine that came out quarterly or bi-monthly or uh, like as in the uh, wine spectator um, every month uh, wine enthusiasts got invented later in the 80s and frankly um, we have fast forward to today the internet uh, became a very popular way of communicating with people and today you still have newspapers and magazines uh, of course and newsletters, um, the most uh, n known being the the wine advocate, uh, mm -hmm. and in its time it was um, pretty much the bee's knees and uh, people that were selling uh, brands of wines or uh, wineries that, that uh, were new, let's say. There was nothing like uh, getting a review of from Parker and the wine advocate. It was kind of like being a comedian and being on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. Yeah. You arrive. And um, after you learn uh, to, to meet all these individuals and help them and be a, I always thought, like be a... Kind of a mentor uh, role? Well, more more of a, you know, be a resource. Okay. You know, be a, be a, be someone who can you know what they like, mm -hmm. you know, and some of them had uh, high-end sort of columns, mm -hmm. some of them had very affordable wines as their um, beat, shall we say. Uh, and in the early 90s, that all kind of evolved into what you see uh, the version of it today, uh, where people were, um, their journalistic endeavors and stories were what was known as blogging. and. Uh, you know, the year 2000 probably was right when it started to pivot and be very important to get behind the influencers and the people who had a voice and they were writing good stories about certain topics. And uh, I always thought, gee, this is the nice thing about it is it always changes. And that's, that is, that's one of the things I really love about wine business and wine branding and how do you make things uh, emotionally connect with consumers. One of those ways, uh, and I believe it's the strongest way, is uh, people writing about your wine in a manner that's positive. Um, whether you're fortunate enough to get your bottle on the Today Show with someone like Leslie Sobraco or you're lucky enough that it's liked so much by all the critics that the scores tend to be in the 90 plus range so we know that the um, the way to move through vintage is uh, third-party recommendations people like yourself that have thousands of people following you uh, even magazines um, which are um, I think on the decline However, they all exist online too. <laughs> so if you share things with people, um, the more people you share them with, the more likely it is that someone might find your wine. And today you can find it on your phone by just going to wine.com and ordering something because they stock 34,000 labels of wines. Or you can do like I like, is going to you know, local wine shops and you know accounts. I like chains too, somewhat because they're they're they have such a nice um, collection. And those tags that say recommended by so and so or 92 points, and, and frankly, used to be very very important who the person was. So you know you had this hierarchy of Jim Lowby, wine spectator, and Robert Parker, wine advocate, and you know someone from the wine enthusiast, etc. And now you have 
a lot bigger pu puzzle of people that recommend wines. So even um, I remember when Anthony Dias Blue was on at Bon Appetit for a decade or so, and he never used the scoring system. And then when he became a freelance on his own guy, he also wrote newspaper. But he, he started with the point system, and people that started using points, I think, really it really made a difference because it was a little bit like getting an A, a B. And no one really talked so much about the C's and the D's. <laughs> yeah. But they, you know, they, they did A, B, and C. The A and B, you got 90 points, you got 89. Depends on the price, you know, depends on the location. Uh, and it was back then that I started judging, too. So when Weston Hotel was my, one of my primary national account clients, Kurt Fisher, the corporate food and beverage, used to gather about 15 people to taste with their F and B types, a couple master sommeliers, uh, some suppliers, of which I was one, a mm -hmm. representative. And uh, that's where I kind of figured out that, you know, if you took two or three or four persons and put them in a panel and they had to taste uh, Chardonnay or they had to taste Cabernet Merlot, whatever it might be, that you would have a, a group uh, sort of effort of the conclusion, you know. And in our case, here in the modern age, we use the terminology gold medal, mm -hmm. which oftentimes means that uh, if the panel was four persons, at least two of them said gold. Mm -hmm. And the consensus uh, voting is kind of a nice way to come up with good value. And if those brands are available, they get to be put on a hotel list or a restaurant list. And that became a pretty typical way, I think, of uh, determining why a restaurant group or why a hotel group would carry something. Not unlike um, um, what does a consumer do when they're affected, let's say, by volunteering at those events or by following the results of the California State Fair. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a state fair, but uh, all of the folks that run it have in the past done, I think, a fairly good job of um, making sure that the cream rises to the top. All competitions that I've judged at, hundreds of them, they're always blind. We don't know, we don't know much at all other than the category it's in. So we don't know AVAs, we don't know you know, alcohols, let's say, uh, et cetera. And, and it's just become a standard here in the US. Uh, <coughs> not unlike it is a standard in Australia, New Zealand, uh, and to some extent, certain markets in um, Europe. Uh, so you got the old world, new world, and the new world is definitely likes a competition not unlike when you submit wines to a magazine, that reviewer editor that covers that area is going to taste a few hundred wines over a period of a few days and come up with the Cabernet report, <laughs> the Chardonnay report. And I always think that for me, one of my roles is to tell the story in front of someone but also uh, make sure that they enter these uh, wines and wine judgings, um, that they get the submissions to the various key uh, writers, that that's how they review wines, whether it's Galoni uh, in today's age, yeah, or whether it's uh, you know somebody uh, you know just has a judging and one of the things they provide are, are numbers. So in addition to a gold medal, maybe you get a 92. Does the 92 compare to this one over here? Doesn't matter. It's a 92 that they can then share with the customer and, and maybe they'll touch their bottle and put it in their uh, grocery cart, so to speak. So labels are important, names are important, price points important. To a degree, categories and AVAs uh, are important. But having a third-party endorsement is pretty much what Wine Spoken Here does. I work with uh, Rusty Eddy and, um, and Robert Larson. Um, we usually have um, 
seven or eight clients, sometimes more, sometimes less, and you balance that all out based on um, a lot of new vintage. If there's a new vintage of something, you kind of have to get right on it. Um, writers, from my recollection, pretty much like things that are current or just released. Um, we represent, um, over the years, a fair amount of California wines, um, maybe mostly Sonoma Napa. But we also have been fortunate to uh, have a lot of Central Coast wines and also uh, Australia and New Zealand. Uh, I think I met you when I had Robert Oatley from Australia as a, he first came back after selling Rosemount to um, the current owners. That's accurate, yes. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and we, we, in fact, I just went out to Lodi and saw the Mettler family on Friday and they have all been talking about putting someone on in PR and they may not have the uh, volume, shall we say, to have someone as an employee. So PR p practitioners are very easy to uh, um, sign up and, and uh, you know, I, I have many, many good, competent people that are friends that uh, do exactly what I do. And, you, know, you find clients, you, you mind them, you give them advice, and then you make sure the wines end up in the position of being uncorked. <laughs> yeah. And then reviewed. And um, it's a, to me, it's an aggregate of all these things today. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, uh, it's, not, it's not that it's hard, it's just that it's s simplest to say one review isn't going to be the home run like mm -hmm. the old days of non-internet. Yeah. Uh, many reviews are what drive sales and I feel that that's part of uh, storytelling is to come up with reasons why you would purchase this fellow's uh, or lady's uh, Chardonnay over this one. You know, and then as you get to learn about family operations and smaller companies that are the mom and dad and the daughters and sons and, <laughs> you know, uh, you kind of like that. Just like shopping local is cool in um, uh, many regions because you have local markets. I think we support vintners the same way that we, we find somebody we really like and the wines are good and the price is right and maybe you met the winemaker. And so our job is to make sure that those winemakers emotionally connect with c customers. Yeah. Or make sure the distributor folks in the middle who are the real people that uh, make shit happen, <laughs> you know, they're the ones that have to make sure those bottles get presented to the locations, especially because uh, Hey, my favorite uh, account to buy uh, Bordeaux is uh, probably Costco because uh, uh, um, they always have a great <laughs> selection of mm -hmm. um, higher-end wines, and um, and the prices are really fair. Yeah. So uh, a different kind of sell than let's say uh, going to the bottle shop in your neighborhood, but they all have one thing in common, and that's shelf talkers that help tell the story. If you're lucky, the story gets partially t told by the uh, you know, information that's on the label or the uh, picture that's on the label or the name. So having a, a family name uh, is, is different than a made up name, how, how it emotionally connects with you. And if you find out that these folks have been farming their land for a couple of decades or more. Uh, using organic or sustainable practices in farming um, uh, might not necessarily be owned by a multinational company but more rooted in you know the region that we're talking about and this, this is very true I think of the old world mm -hmm. and uh, however I've always believed it doesn't really matter what tastes good tastes good and if you had a, someone help you get to that bottle because there's only half a million bottles out there. Uh, if someone says, hey, this is worth a, a, a stop uh, and, 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 and you get 20 bucks, uh, 
whatever the price might be. Uh, I don't think wine is a large investment. It's a pleasure that we have uh, for our palate. It has a lot of, um, I saw someone say, well, what's the right time to drink wine? And I was thinking, well, it isn't uh, 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 the same as uh, spirits where there's this idea that a cocktail comes at five o'clock uh, because that's, you know, cocktail hour. Wine is a food uh, accompaniment, not unlike ketchup and mustard. And um, we see it consumed, I think, at lunchtime. And we also see it on Sundays if we have brunch. You might be a, a champagne or a sparkling drinker. Uh, you might be taking that same fizz and mixing it with OJ. I hope it's fresh squeezed. Um, or you might, um, you know, have a cocktail of some sort. You know, if you're in New Orleans, uh, where the um, Tales of the Cocktail uh, uh, event just finished up, um, people will have certain mixed drinks uh, uh, for breakfast. So for a new brand that has an aspiration to penetrate the market, and it's quite a saturated market, as we talked about, um, what would be your advice? I mean, you clearly act as a conduit between the source and the end user or intermediate user, as you described. Ooh. I, I heard you say a lot about personalizing and emotional attachment. Is that at the top of the heap for the young brand? I think when you're, yeah, I think when you're new, um, and there's a lot of new. I mean, w when you and I bump into each other at uh, uh, events where the trade is being poured, uh, some of uh, very new products that they might not have had before, um, to get a consumer to buy for the first time mm -hmm. something that is relatively new to them. Um, is a uh, the first step, mm -hmm. and um, I remember when Brand New Zealand came on with um, Cloudy Bay and some of the other m notables from New Zealand, and most of this uh, wine was coming from Marlborough, and it didn't taste like our Sauvignon Blanc. Whether it was Sonoma, Napa, Temecula, doesn't matter. It was really racy and, and different, and mm -hmm. uh, and then it became, you know, you become part of a buzz. So that new brand um, kind of got into the limelight in a, in the same way I think that even popular priced brands that are new either get embraced by the consumer, or maybe we scratch our heads a little bit, but. The Prisoner, for example, when it was uh, Finney's uh, Orange Swift, uh, uh, brand new. I mean, they're they're. I think their uh, big uh, strategy was create a label that's nothing like anything else, quite unique, and then luck has it in the same sense that. A uh, couple of reviewers that are important really liked it. And it was kind of the first time that somebody who took Zinfandel and added two or three other ingredients or grape types. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we were all varietal centric, I mean, or uh, region centric. Right. And all of a sudden there were things popping up that were not, neither. And that new, that new. Try and yeah. find something that's unique to you. And if you make great wine, then some critic that matters is going to like it. So again, I'm hearing differentiate yourself from the crowd. Oh yes. You know, stand out for some <coughs> reason, whether it's the exterior, the aesthetic, or what's in a bottle, or maybe, hopefully, even both. Yeah. But make sure that it's something different, something fresh, something that that hasn't been done before. Yeah, and uh, the reality is that uh, that's one of the things that, just like labels, you know, labels used to always be these white paper things that were shaped in a rectangle or a square. Mm -hmm. Now, it can be anything. And color is, is big, and, and or in, in the case of Prisoner, a very brooding 
style of uh, the, its original format. Um, if you stand for something, um, I remember when Fetzer first got started in the late 80s and uh, early uh, 90s, they stood for organic uh, and sustainable farming and also low impact uh, in their bottling procedures. So uh, for a popular price, it really did very well because uh, there were no other like uh, uh, like that in that, that, that price point. The conclusion of this interview can be found in the next podcast, already available for your download. Thanks again for tuning in to the official podcast of Pal Exposure, featuring Alona Thompson. 